There is a distinctly intuitive way that Richard Rohr teaches. It has captivated seekers for years through his word and pen. Through conversations with Richard and years of study, we are playing with a simple distillation of Richard's teaching philosophy into three animating questions. What do we want to know? How do we want to grow? How do we want to show up in our lives and in the world? The intent is that we at the CAC take these questions seriously as foundational for furthering Richard's teachings in the world. There's a permissive empowerment for folks to experiment with and uniquely live out these teachings from their own contexts, conditions, and communities. It is incarnational mysticism in service to the world. In our conversation today, we are back sitting in Richard's living room. Mike walks through these three questions with Richard, and together we hover over the nuances of good theology, apophatic knowing, and the metaphorical, alchemical language of transformation. And Corey shows us all up by his ability to locate scripture references first. From the Center for Action and Contemplation, I'm Mike Petro. I'm Paul Swanson. And this is Everything Belongs. Richard, as always, it's great to see you again. Thank you for welcoming us back to the Hermitage. Look forward to having a little more conversation with you today. It's always exciting. You guys make such good observations, and they're so ordinary. So let's hear it again. What are well, you going to say? You know, it's it's our great joy in mm. life, and the goal we strive for to be as ordinary as possible. So, here, here. you know, it was... Um, was fun in one of our previous conversations, we were talking about you as a teacher. And Paul and I shared that drawing from your teaching, we've come up with three guiding questions that we take into all the coursework and the programs that we do at the Center for Action and Contemplation. Wow. I yeah. can't wait to hear them. They're very ordinary, <laughs> very right, simple. Good. And, and the three questions that we think about are what? What do we want people to know? How do we want people to grow or transform? And how do we want people to show up in the world as a result? That's lovely. And you got you two figured that out. So the best truths are so simple, hmm. they go beneath the radar of yeah. observation. Wow. Okay, proceed. All right. So 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 just for fun, Richard, let's talk about the three questions. What, what do you think, what do we really want people to know in the teaching that continues coming out of the center and carrying on your legacy? I love that, that you, know, you teach practice and you teach, teach action, but you still give people such profound transformative knowledge. What do you think people really need to know nowadays? You know, our first thought, mine too, would be that whoever this being is, we call God, uh, our assumption would be we got to be convinced that this God is good. Mm. Not neutral, not certainly not wrathful and bad, uh, but the way that goodness is experienced is that God is active and caring and involved in your life. That's what people have yet to be convinced of. God is an abstract formula that we have to believe in and he needs praise. He is a he. Uh, so all of that has to be cleared away. Is it possible for me to believe that God is a caring, involved presence in my life? That's the only God you're going to fall in love with. Oh. That's profound. And, it, and it, it leaves me sitting with the challenge of what it really means to know that. Mm -hmm. Like we oh, want yeah. people to not to think that. But to know it, I think about that famous story, you know, of Carl Jung, where they asked him, "Do you believe in God?" And he said, "I, I don't have to believe. I know." I know. Yeah. Yes. But so then, if we move into the second question, 
how do we want people to grow? If people really knew that God, or whatever this is, is benevolent, how would that challenge people to grow or transform? Not just benevolent, because even that could remain abstract. Yes. It has to be benevolently engaged, knowing me more than I know myself, caring about me more than I even know how to care for myself. That is only experienced if you go on an inner journey with this presence. If you give God a chance to act in your life, to forgive, to care. If you don't experience God forgiving you, I know you did all those asinine things, Richard. That's not really what I'm concentrating on. You have to know that personally, immediately, actively, experientially. Then the spiritual life begins. Uh, and then you cannot help but grow because you live in a safe universe, an active universe, where there's an engagement. That's what most people don't seem to enjoy. The people who do can talk about it very personally, very warmly, very immediately. Uh, yeah. It's usually, I hate to say this to a room with three men in it, but it's usually women who come to that first because they understand life relationally more than men do. Men have to work to get into a relational universe. Seems to me, we have to work at it. Now when we do, and it happens, it becomes very dear, yeah. It's interesting too, I feel like there's, uh, in moving from knowing something to really sort of transforming into it, sort of living the teaching, there seems that there has to be some pushback or wrestling, or interrogating ideas with lived experience. You know, we, we, this podcast is called Everything Belongs, named after one of your most popular books. And you and I have had many conversations where I've said, I know everything belongs, but why does it have to hurt so bad? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it, it seems that sort of wrestling and pushing back, is that a part of that transformation? Yeah, it's, it's the overcoming of the resistance that is the relationship. If you don't have some resistance to pass through, to step over, uh, it's not believable. So no res resistance, I'm calling it holy disorder in my new book. Uh, people who just glibly say God loves me at the kindergarten level because they've been trained to say it. But you don't take them that seriously. But people who you know, their intelligence, their sinfulness, their imperfection has forced them to overcome those barriers, has allowed them, has called them. Those that believers you, okay, I might just take him seriously or her seriously. Yeah. So the, the transformed sinner is much more attractive than the natural saint. Uh, someone who knows they're full of shit mm. <laughs> and still believes in the loving presence who's engaging me, who's forgiving me, who's accepting me, who's still empowering me in my imperfection. That's what changes the world. We don't need any more canonized Catholic saints. The one I've made fun of, of course he's a Jesuit, <laughs> is St. Aloysius, you good Protestant boys would know nothing about. 
But there was always a statue of St. Aloysius in every seminary chapel because, get ready, he died in his late 20s. He never looked upon the face of a woman. <laughs> wow. Way to go, St. Aloysius. A low Except bar of his, mother, <laughs> his mother. His <laughs> mother. And, you know, he must have been quite a good person. He dealt with uh, the uh, plague people. And that's what he died from. But why do we create these myths that he never gazed at the face of a woman his whole life? And so we had his statue there. Look at beautiful Aloysius. <laughs> oh, come on, come on. Canonized, the word for that is hagiography. Hey, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, the life of a saint. It developed a whole canon, uh, canonical practice. And we, we loved virgins who never fell. That did a huge disservice to the gospel. It really did. I would have assumed St. Aloysius would have died from a head wound walking into something because it was looking at the ground. <laughs> Not looking at the face of the woman. How was that supposed to be inspiring? Because yeah. all of us had already, yeah. when we heard the story of his life, we had already failed. Yeah. Because we had looked at faces of women or men. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, well, we said this previously. I, I love that your teaching doesn't... Um, your teaching has never been about avoiding sin or no. avoiding wrongdoing right. or avoiding mistakes. It's been about transformation. Yeah. This idea that we come to God by doing it wrong instead of doing, doing it right. Doing it wrong. You first have to do it wrong and experience forgiveness. Isn't that what the story of the prodigal son teaches mm -hmm. right. us? He does it wrong, but he comes back to the Father. Mm. It's such a perfect story. And the other one does it right. The older son would be St. Aloysius. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, you'll never hear about him. Mm. It's, uh, well, and I love that. And that's where it seems like the growth and the transformation takes place is in the doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. um, which again, I think was what, what really drew me to your teaching. And so we then add this third question into the equation, which we also take from, from studying everything you've offered us, which is just how do we want people to show up in the world? Because our transformation should lead us to want to help transform the world. Yeah. The servant leader. Yeah. What you know when, when God has, as it were, gotten down on his knees and forgiven us, and exalted us, then the only thing that makes sense of your life is to do the same as your lover. Mm. That's how you know you've had a, a divine lover, mm. that you want to serve other people. You're not looking for a role. You're not looking for a title. You're not looking for a costume. Uh, You want to do for others what was done to your soul. That's the giveaway. Servant leadership. When you see the heart of a servant in another person, they want to help you. They want to heal you. Now, most of the stories in the New Testament are healing. Why didn't that blow us away? And we, we thought to be a good Catholic was not to need healing because mm -hmm. you hadn't sinned. <laughs> oh, what a disservice. You know, when Pope Francis said recently that Catholic, the Pope said this, so don't hate me. Catholic sexual theology is still in diapers. Mm. <laughs> he said that. Uh-huh. That's pretty Still profound. in diapers. That is just brilliant. And he's a Jesuit too. Yeah. So I said a bad thing about Aloysius, but a good thing about Pope Francis. I, I appreciate that. I, one of the earliest parts of your teaching I heard that really landed deeply with me was when you said Christianity 
as a religion is still growing up. I forget how you said it. It's still infantile. Yeah, yeah. it's still in its it's infancy. still in the infant. It's at best teenage spirituality, mm. waiting for infatuation. Mm. Mm. Yeah. It gives me hope, though. Yes, it does. For growth, huh? Gives me hope, too. So, Richard, using these three questions and in, in living your teachings forward and carrying the legacy on, how would you, how do you think people should be putting their transformation in the service of the world? How do you think people need to show up in the world going forward? If you're listening well, to First, your let me say what it's not. Okay. It's not because we've all been infected by this, attending services, mm. life as attending. And we, we clergy needing to create a job for ourselves, created services at which the people of God had to attend. And that just distorted. Why is it a Sunday morning is about working with hospice or or Habitat for Humanity. Why wouldn't that please God more than, why would God get off on people gathering in rows and singing songs to him? <laughs> Is God that much of a narcissist that I need to be worshiped? I need to be praised? Huh. It's a funny play on words to think about a Sunday service. Yeah. And what service means. Mm. Interesting. Right. Oh, what service really means. Yeah, very good. How do we use that word service? It isn't really service. But people have always had a need for family, mm -hmm. for community, and they still do. And I wouldn't begrudge them or take that away. If you really need to join your community every Sunday. But at least in the Catholic world, those Sunday gatherings are highly anonymous. Mm -hmm. So if that's what it's not. Oh yeah, okay, that's what it's, it's not attending. It's relational. Mm. And relational in a servant way. How can I help the world? So let's call it helping rather than service. It is service, but... Uh, it's a way of participation, too. Uh, you, you've heard me talk about the cult of innocence. Yes. Have I talked about that on this tape? Not no, on this. You've talked about it with Brian on his podcast. Oh, when... okay, yeah. And that was that was what? There's something that came from Ryan, that came from Nadia Boltz Weber, That's this right. idea of the cult of innocence, just trying to constantly put myself in the camp and let myself off the hook. I'm the innocent person. To prove that Christianity became for many people the way to prove that I'm not a sinner. Right. Mm. <laughs> the way we project all of our shadow onto sinners. The assumption is we're not. Whereas could it be that Christianity is really solidarity with the marginalized, the sinners, the outsiders, the immigrants? We haven't achieved that. Because mm -hmm. we want to prove we're not outsiders. We're loyal, bona fide church members who believe the gospel. It's just, I don't know what good it is. I, forgive me for being so strong, but I would see you coming to work together with your community, but always for the sake of solidarity with yeah. whoever has been pushed out of the community. Right. Mm. And I don't think this is radical anymore. It's just, it's the only thing that makes sense. Yeah. And I could see where the cult of innocence would keep us from that because we don't want to be in solidarity with even what's been pushed out in ourselves. Yeah. What you were saying earlier, it seems like that's sort of where alchemy of transformation takes place 
is with Very the raw material of our mistakes and our and our errors and our disappointments. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, how do we get in this situation of Christians being against transgender people? Mm. How did that happen? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Why is it you think God doesn't like transgender people? Because they're not like you, who think you're normal. <laughs> right. Yeah. And it, it seems oh. like the the cult of innocence naturally breeds these types of purity culture. Or, purity or, culture. Or, 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 On some criteria. Yes. I don't gamble. I don't play cards. Yeah. I mean, it got that silly. Yeah. I don't dance. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Church oh. becomes a gated community that yeah. protects I, everything um, that you think is outside of the What good is it? That one of the highlights of my guest bathroom is I have a tiny little book sitting next to the toilet that says, is the devil in modern amusements? And it's from the 50s and it talks about how the devil's in card playing, dancing, theater, cinema, newspapers, um, wine, uh, pretty much anything (laughs) fun. (laughs) Uh, Anything fun. Yeah. Yeah. Just pleases God. Do you realize what you're saying when you say that? People don't because, so God is basically a, What's the word we used for spoil sport? Killjoy. Uh, yeah. Buzzkill. What's the God's word? a buzzkill. Buzzkill. See, that's your generation's <laughs> word. Mm. We never had that uh-huh. word. A buzzkill. Yeah. Mike, Why would you yeah. like such a God? It's right. <laughs> a great question. It's a great question. You've all seen movies where someone's having sex and they put down the picture of their mother. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Accurate. Uh, yeah, that's great. Mother could not like this that I'm having sex. <laughs> mm. How silly. But people don't reflect on what does this say about God? Now, that's our job as preachers. If that's the mor- moral agenda of God, what does this say about who God is and why we need good theology? And I don't think it's the majority position is good theology. Right. No. At right. all. And that convicts the Orthodox, the Catholics, and the Evangelicals. Mm. And that's why there's still important things we need people, we want people uh-huh. to know. Yeah. yeah. That conversation. Yeah. yeah. And Mike, you brought up a great phrase of spiritual alchemy and thinking yeah. about. I'm alchemy. using that in my new book. Oh, you are? Really? Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, Mike well, and I talk. Oh, go ahead. The alchemy of, oh, I don't know what I'm saying, but it's in the new book. Okay. Alchemy, that's a good, well, of course, you unions love it. We do love alchemy. But that was what he got. Yeah. We, we've we been musing on this language of alchemy to consider like how we learn. So there's the raw mm. materials that come into it. There's the fire, there's the crucible, mm. and it's the transformation mm. process into something new. Very good. How, how do you see this, this, uh, this process of what do we want people to know? How do we want people to grow? And how do we want them to show up in the world? How does alchemy, does it feel like an appropriate metaphor? Because all the ways it contains these raw materials, these ingredients, the, this crucible that can hold the fire so that transformation can happen. How do you see that as potentially a helpful metaphor for how yeah. one might approach their own spiritual life and and language to kind of point to like i'm in the crucible right now or this fire is getting hot or how do i keep the edges hot so that Uh, gold may come out of this experience wonderful you guys are doing your work where is that line you good evangelicals i'm going to god is like a refiner's fire is that oh apocalypse feel like it's isaiah but give me two seconds check it i have a i have a tiny device in my pocket that can answer this question (laughs) Because it's saying the same thing, right? Like, of course, yeah. a refiner's fire is alchemy. Yes. Yeah. Malachi three two. Look at that. He's the real it. Protestant. Yeah. He is. Corey's the truest. <laughs> and it's Malachi. Well, Malachi isn't much longer than three chapters. It must be at the very end of the Old Testament. Is that your last book in the Old Testament, Malachi? Or is that a Catholic Bible? Oh, I just Googled, Richard. I, 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 should, I should out myself. 
I don't recall now because I hang, I've been hanging out no, with too the, many Catholics. No, the last verse is the Father's. Uh, oh, they turn the hearts of fathers toward their sons, yeah. and sons toward their father. Uh -huh. I use that in men's work. What? Where is it? No, there's a verse in Isaiah that says that talks about purifying us the way that metal is purified. Well, yeah, there. That's that what kind chapter of, of that's Isaiah? That's right at the beginning. First um, Isaiah. It's the calling of Isaiah. In the new book, I say first Isaiah is really the classic prophet. Mm. His his religious experience, his anger, yeah. and eventually his lamentation. One to thirty-nine. Well, to respond to what you just said, Paul. Uh, Alchemy produce, presumes many ingredients to something. It's not just doing it right, or it's the mixture, uh, like a good cook. Oh. It makes the spiritual journey a little more complex than obeying laws, you know. It's an alchemical solution. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, Jung did so many good things. And that, he just introduced you that word alchemy was one of his good things. Uh, I think one thing I appreciate about the way we're talking about this is there's the very three direct questions. Yeah. But then it doesn't. It doesn't mean that they're linear in that way, that they're they're gonna all be melted in this way where they're melted. You have to be attentive to the way certain questions are showing up. But it doesn't mean that you'll go from knowing something or learning on that learning process that way in the context of your life. That all may be present at once, but we are talking about it in a way to 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 put a spotlight so that we can see the distinction before we can see the union of them all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would clarify that with that first question, it's interesting, if the question is, what do we want people to know? It's, it's this communicating out of information. But if the question is, what do we want to know? Mm -hmm. Then what it does is it centralizes the importance of curiosity mm -hmm. and all of us learning together. And I wonder, Richard, is there something alchemical about curiosity in the spiritual life mm. that keeps us all going? So you force me to think new things, yes. Curiosity presumes the apophatic tradition that I do not yet know. And when we call it beginner's mind, that was, I used to give that in the first talk at the male initiation rites. We all need to go back to beginner's mind. Those are the only people who are teachable. Everybody else knows everything already. Unless we can again honor the apophatic, half of the journey. Protestantism just emphasized the cataphatic, knowing, and knowing certainly. Now most of Catholicism did too, I don't mean, mm -hmm. but we had this subtext of darkness theology, and uh, that saved us a lot of times. Pope Francis is a natural at it. He doesn't need to just walk around as Pope saying certain things. Whenever you have a patience with uncertainty, with not knowing, with metaphor, all, lang all language is metaphorical, you're in the apophatic tradition. And unless you're a bit apophatic, I know that's a big word, but we're just trying to show we do know the tradition. And this isn't just my 21st century idea, you know. Uh, you know, it's really happened, happening in American culture now with seeing that the very people who claim such certitude are the big fans of a certain former president. Who, who tells demonstrable lies one after the other, that this supposed love of the truth has led you to tolerate total 
lies. Wow, the whole thing's being exposed right now. Oh, well. It's Am I responding to what you just said? Yeah, no. I, I don't yeah, know I'm if just, I am. Forgive I'm, me. I'm if lost I'm not. in thought on what you me thinking it's for just, sure. It's just horrible. Well, the yeah. state of American politics now. Horrible. Yeah, I know. It's just childish. A bunch of kids just making truth whatever they want truth to be. Yeah. <laughs> and too many of them carry the badge Christian. Mm. Yeah. This is what your Christianity gave you? You who love the truth so much? A total non-love of truth. But just love of personal advantage. Mm. So you see that the ego was in charge, not the gospel. Yeah, and that confident certainty that shuts out curiosity and the possibility of unknowing. That's yeah, I feel like the landscape of our culture is inviting us into the humility of that curiosity and good, well put, in an well. apophatic openness. We do not yeah. know. There is so much we do How not know. We possibly know climate crisis, but the ways in which we are are just beginning to understand the cosmos mm. and how interrelated and interconnected we are in our actions and the effect they have on our planet. And then as the as your the web telescope shows us so much more than we could ever imagine seeing. Yeah. I feel so small in that. I'm and so it's grateful. It's still for that. moving. Yes. And still showing what we never knew. We didn't know about this galaxy. We didn't know about this galaxy. <laughs> Why don't people make those connections? And this is the shape of the universe. That the space outdoes the planets mm. by far. Oh my. We're getting there. But it, it's forcing us to respect for science, which is no ability, but no ability proceeding by experiment. <laughs> Experiments with truth. Wasn't that Gandhi's phrase? Experiments with truth. Is this true? We need to train Christians in experience. Is this true? Is God Trinitarian? Don't just decide to hate it. Don't just decide to love it. Experiment with it. Is there a way that God comes at you from three angles, hmm. at least? No. That's what it, and that's what it feels like this season of the CAC is in this approach is experiments with truth and yes. trying to look at it from multiple it's angles. It's nice to end on that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Everything Belongs will continue in a moment. The impact of Richard's story career as a spiritual teacher flows outward into his global student body, inspiring their fuller participation in the cosmic dance and the general dance of our lives. In this spirit, next you'll hear Mike and I sitting together on the CAC campus to talk about how the questing nature of these questions invites us to explore the expanding communal wisdom of our CAC faculty, the contemplative lineages, and the curriculum of our lives. Mike and I call this our contemplative laboratory. Mike, we had this wonderful conversation with Richard in his house talking about three questions that really drive and animate the way we think about learning yeah. at the CAC. And we're trying to embed those in every program that we do here. And it's fun to be in this conversation with you now because you're so much of the architect of that. You know, so much of your training helps shine a light on some of the ways that one can learn in the Christian contemplative traditions. Thanks, Paul. Uh, you know, what a rich and fantastic conversation that was. I just, I am so filled with gratitude and appreciation that we get to do this, that we get to sit with Richard at this stage in his life where he's integrated these teachings so deeply and that we get to sort of 
tease these ideas out with him. I mean, I, I, I can tell you right off the bat, like I learned something <laughs> in the middle of our conversation when we were talking through the three questions. I had a massive light bulb that went off for me or, or perhaps I should say went on. That might be the better use <laughs> uh -huh. of the metaphor, right? I had a light bulb that went on for me that was that was really, really, uh, really profound. Like if you want to just jump right into it. It was wild, you know, when we were talking to Richard, so we have these three questions. What do we want to know? How do we want to grow? How do we want to show up in the world? Mm -hmm. And we were talking about the first question and I found myself saying, what do we want people to know? And, and I called it out towards the end where I realized, gosh, that's not the question. It's not what do we want people to know? It's what do we want to know? And the temptation for us is so strong in working with these amazing teachers to think that they have this great vault of wisdom that we are walking back into with them and, and you know, like bringing out for our listeners and our readers and our students. But in reality, the question, what do we wanna know is a question for all of us, including our teachers. Mm -hmm. We are all exploring this together and we're all kind of on the same quest, which is wild, which is really, really wild. And I love that all of our teachers sort of embody that and Richard too. They're just sort of taking us along on their adventure. You know, I, I, I think about my great teacher origin who talks about how this is about dialogue, not definition. It's about exploration, not explanation. And the real quest is the questions. That's what I love about Richard is his willingness. Um, God, if I had a dollar for every time I watched him interact with a student and say, you're teaching me, you know? <laughs> uh -huh. it, like his curiosity seems endless. Mm -hmm. I don't know, how did that feel for you? Well, you're hitting the nail on the head. I That shift from people to we, it it adds in the communal element, which is, has always been there, at least to the depths that I've stu studied uh, the contemplative traditions, that community helps form knowledge and practice mm -hmm. and activism in the world, the prophetic, like prophets will stand up, teachers will stand up, but it's always with the community in mind, in service to the community through love. And I think that nuance helps us show us that that Richard is a profound and gifted teacher. Yeah. In a lot of ways, he will shine a light forward on something that we should all learn. And there's other teachers, there's other people who do that in different ways. And so that's where the communal aspect, I feel like, comes in where someone, there, there's expertise that Richard does not have, that he cannot have because of his own yeah. lived experience, his own training. And so to have these other reflections of, of light that can offer guidance, that can offer insight, that can offer wisdom that are not his to do, it helps extrapolate the beauty and the joy of what a communal learning environment can do. And that, that requires humility, right? To be like one teacher, one person, or even yeah. one community doesn't have all of the wisdom. Well, and it also requires, I think, infinite curiosity. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things I love working with Richard and our and our core faculty and, and now sort of our invited faculty is watching Richard get excited about what different faculty bring. One of my fondest memories is when Dr. B joined us and Dr. B was giving us these profound teachings on Howard Thurman. Uh -huh. And I showed up at Richard's house one day and there was a big, Howard Thurman quote on the wall. And I was like, that's new. And he was going on and on about the brilliance of Howard Thurman. And he said, I don't remember if this is an Augustine quote or not, but he said, it's like late in life have I come to thee. Mm -hmm. And he said like, Howard Thurman is such a profound genius and I can't believe I'm only discovering his wisdom now. And it's wild, but Richard's like that with so many things. He just keeps on learning and he's passionate about things that other teachers are passionate about. I, I, it makes me think about um, curiosity mm -hmm. as a core part of the spiritual life, right? Like, you know this, my, my great teacher's origin of Alexandria. And one of my favorite quotes from him is this praising of curiosity as a gift from God. Check this out. He says, an eager longing for the reality of things is natural to us and implanted in our soul by the divine. Much more and beyond all comparison does the mind burn with unspeakable longing to learn the design of things. Just as, oh, pause, 
Corey, we got to pause that one. Hang on a second. I buggered it up. I'm so sorry. It's okay. Hang on, hang on, hang on. This is why we edit. Try that again. An eager longing for the reality of things is natural to us and implanted in our soul by the divine. Much more and beyond all comparison does the mind burn with unspeakable longing to learn the desire of things. And in that language, the mind might actually also be described as the heart. He says, this longing, this love has been implanted in us by God. Just as the eye naturally desires light and sight and our body by its nature desires food and drink, so our soul cherishes a natural and appropriate longing to know God's truth and learn the causes of things. What I love about this quote is like, this is erotic Uh language, right? Burning, loving, longing, desiring, cherishing. It makes it sound like curiosity is a contemplative language for being in love with reality. And of course that makes sense to me when we love something or someone, we want to know more about them or that just as we ourselves want to know or be known. Paul talks about knowing and being known as as part of love. But I also love that Origen says it's natural. And here's what I wonder, Paul, you're a dad. How natural when you look at your kids is curiosity as Mm. part of their reality? Mm. Gosh, that's so, it just permeates through everything that, that they do. And I was thinking as you read that quote about, I think it was, Abraham Joshua Heschel, who prays for wonder. And I think that children are born with this kind of natural curiosity and wonder and the questions that get asked or the pushback to things that have become so muted by their mundanity of, mm. of how they show up uh, that I don't question them anymore. And, wow. then, and then they ask the question that pierces a long held illusion that helps me just cope with uh, getting through another day or like, why do you do this? Why do we go here? Um, there's this image that just flashed from my eyes of, we were recently traveling and my four-year-old son looked at a cemetery full of headstones and he said, why is there a chess game in that field? Oh my God, I love that. Yeah, and I just sat with that and it just opened up things for me thinking about life as a game Here's all these chess pieces not moving. The game is over. And yet his question was him trying to take the, re- the things that he knows about reality and putting them squarely with the confusion about this chess, these chess pieces. Wow. <laughs> and, and this is, you know, as there's so many parents say that, right, where you know, my children are my teachers. Yeah. And what it has really helped me, I, I say that all the time too, but it also helps me look at everyone as a potential teacher. Um, because of the way that we, in our own lived experiences, bring our own lens of curiosity. And sometimes it's prophetic, sometimes it's a balm, sometimes it it introduces me to a new teacher that I, I didn't know before, or a new reading or a new tradition. Like your, your story about Richard and Howard Thurman, like that's exactly it. This mm-hmm. is why I think we need teachers to help us open doors to other deep, teachings that can rejuvenate our soul or or draw us into deeper connection through uh, the practice of curiosity and the practice of wonder in all that we do. Wow. That's a mic drop moment, Paul. I, I, um, and I'm never going to look at a chessboard the same way again. That is amazing. It's extraordinary how the wonder of a child and that infinite curiosity can take something so familiar and completely spin it on its axis. And I, you know, I I love the notion of thinking about that as an intrinsic aspect of contemplation, right? Mm -hmm. If contemplation is a long loving look at the real, something that Richard says a lot, curiosity is a part of our falling into that loving aspect, right? And looking afresh again, falling in love with reality by sort of seeing it again for the first time, just the way that the eyes of a child say, Oh, that looks like a chessboard. And you go, oh my God, it does. Mm-hmm. And I love, I love where that inspired you to think about life as a game. And it helps me when you talk about our children being our teachers, it again takes me back to every one of those moments I've watched Richard interact with a student and say, you're teaching me. Yeah. 
and realize he's not being placating or polite. He genuinely means it. Yeah. Every one of us, you know, all of our voices together create that collective conversational universe. Uh, we, we, I love to joke with you about CAC um, sort of being a contemplative laboratory, yeah. right? Where we're studying all these different contemplative practices and trying to figure out what actually works for ordinary people in their day-to-day -day lives. Mm -hmm. And we joke and say, it's like any laboratory, like sometimes you try something and it doesn't work and it explodes in your face <laughs> and you go, all right, back to the drawing board. Yeah. But I, I, I don't know, I don't wanna push the metaphor too far, but I love that like we're all sort of scientists together. There's not a single person who's wrestling with this who their curiosity and their questions and the sort of transformation that they undergo in doing that doesn't contribute to the rest of the collective conversation and the, you know, I would say the body of Christ using Christian language. Yeah, and I, I love that you brought up that metaphor of the contemplative laboratory because it's a fun visual, but it, it also paints a picture of so much of what we are trying to do yeah. to in, in the work that we do at the CAC mm -hmm. and how it, its origin is love. And so yes. I love how you also brought in the, the, the sensuality of, of language through that origin quote and just prayer in general, longing, hunger, the ways in which that that is the erotic sensual drive yeah. at the core of uh, how love expresses us into the laboratory. Yeah. And that it's the service of love sparked by these strong desires for yeah. deeper union with God and one another and this planet. And I just think that the more we can experiment in these directions, the more we can understand how that love is inflamed and can spread and catch fire elsewhere. Man, I love that. That's, I just want to take a second with that. And I think what's interesting is, you know, in, um, in a lot of Christian mystical literature, a phrase that comes up and up over and over again, we don't have time to explore it here, is the wound of love. Mm. And it, it makes me think of Richard's insight that great love and great suffering are our greatest teachers. Nice. So it's intriguing is to recognize that when we, when we come to learn, when we bring our curiosity, we are shaped, each one of us individually, by our own great loves and by our own great suffering. Our wounds also kind of shape our unique wondering and the questions we ask. Our wounds shape our unique wandering and the path that our life takes. And our wounds, Origen talks about our wounds becoming health bestowing wounds. Our wounds shape our unique wisdom. Mm. And I feel like that takes us so um, naturally into that next question of how do we want to grow? Yeah, yeah. Because in the end of the day, Richard says this all the time, contemplative learning is about transformation, not information. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, our curiosity brings us to sort of learning things, but then wrestling with them and like kind of getting into this question of, how does this actually hit my lived reality? You know, in theory, in the second season of this podcast, we're gonna talk about Falling Upward, one of Richard's greatest books. And there'll be so many opportunities for so many different voices to say, okay, when we talk about the first half of life and second half of life, what does that really mean for me? Mm -hmm. And I think it's that wrestling with reality and lived experience that brings about growth, yeah. but it's not easy. <laughs> and it does bring some of our suffering and our wounds, right? Yeah. Into the into the experience. What do you think? Well, I, I think you're, again, just, that's brilliant. I think it's bringing the fullness of our own life in conversation with the text. Mm. And since this podcast is taking Richard's teachings and how do we, asking the question, how do we live these forward? Yeah. And going through these three kind of driving questions of what do we want to know? How do we want to grow? And how do we want to show up? Yeah. Like, we're taking these texts at these kind of foundational places and then we're putting them in conversation yeah. with us, with Richard, with guests that we're gonna have on, with other staff members, with the CAC in general, with the world. Like yeah. the conversation, the ripples of that are endless. Yeah, And I think that's the exciting thing about what we're seeking to do in, in, in this podcast is taking the, uh, this question of wrestling and not just we know that there's wisdom, there's practice, there's truth in these books. 
And how do we put that in deep conversation with my suffering? Yeah. And your suffering. Yeah. And your experiences, my experiences, and our guests' experiences. Those yeah. folks who are living in contexts that I am, am learning about, that I'm on the edge of my own curiosity and discovery with. Um, the opportunity for dropping into depth while having a hand on contemplative traditions that are speaking through the entire world, um, but particularly the way that those mystics and teachers that we touch uh, from ancient days to here and now. And then we could have those conversations with folks, um, teachers from, I, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, we could have, we could have these conversations that, that are going to really allow the wrestling to take yeah. center stage without having to feel like we've arrived at perfect answers. Yeah. We're trying to show our work in that way. Yeah, and I think that's so valuable to keep in mind is that we don't arrive at perfect answers. Um, I So one of our coworkers here at the Center for Action and Contemplation is Barb Lopez, mm -hmm. and she is a, a, a student. Um, what I love about her is that she has academic level understanding, but also a great personal love for learning theory. Yes. Um, and Barb, if you hear this and I get it wrong, please forgive me. But <laughs> she talks a lot about, if I, if I say this correct, transformational learning theory. And one of the things that brings us into a deep learning experience is what's called a disorienting dilemma, mm -hmm. right? And so discerning listeners may now pick up on the fact that our three questions are a little bit tied to Richard's notion of construction, deconstruction, reconstruction. Uh, what is it? Order, disorder, reorder. That's right. That's the wisdom pattern. We don't need to get into that. That's another season of the podcast. But recognizing that it is sometimes a disorienting dilemma, a deep wrestling. Origen talks about being scandalized. That invites us, ironically and paradoxically, into the opportunities to learn something new because it shakes up our sensibilities. It causes us to question our certainties. And it opens us in a lot of ways, even if it's a little bit terrifying and it feels like the ground's been pulled out from underneath us. And, and that's all well and good to talk about questions driving a podcast or a learning theory, but I think it's, it's lived experience for most of us. I think it's also what brings a lot of us to Richard and the CAC's material is that we want to be able to have real spiritual conversations about the fact that life can be terrifying and disorienting sometimes. Mm, I think you're so good at at reminding us of this point. Like I feel like that is one of the the ways that you bring your own sense of scholarship, your own understanding of this work, and live it forward is by bringing it into. And how does this affect the suffering of the world? Yeah. My suffering, collective suffering. Yeah. What? Where does that drive for you come into this? Like how how does that pull you? How do how do you pull those questions into your life and, and share them with that level of generativity? Well, I, I think you're being overly generous. So thank <laughs> you. I think what it is is like our teachers are really good at that. And I and I think I get to I get to sit at the feet of some really, really brilliant uh, guides here. But what I see in all our teachers is that they've integrated this material through lived experience mm -hmm. and through their own great love and great suffering. And they've not shied away from the hard questions that that asks. Mm -hmm. You know, this has come up a bunch. We've talked about this a bunch. This has come up in other podcasts. Like for me, one of the paradoxically most painful gifts of my life was that when I was sort of studying this theory, I also went through the one of the most profound experiences of personal suffering in my life um, uh, in, in losing my mom, losing my brother, you know, losing some other things, going through a massive rebuilding of what it meant for me to be a spiritual person and a person of faith. And uh, paradoxically, that made me really, really curious mm. about how other people navigate that and experience it. And it's a curiosity that I think will never end. And I think it's a curiosity that I share with you and our teachers. And it's not an abstract curiosity. Yeah. It's a compassionate curiosity. It's that curiosity we were talking about earlier, which is a form of love, which is really at the end of the day, ideas are fine and they're fun, yeah. right? We love ideas, but what really matters is what does this actually feel like 
in the heart of a person who's living it, right? What does it feel like to be a person who suddenly feels estranged from their God image, from an idea about reality and people that has given them comfort for a huge portion of their life and suddenly it's gone Mm -hmm. or it's been taken away or it just doesn't work anymore. What does that feel like? And do, do the great contemplative teachers of our tradition actually offer helpful wisdom, right? When they, t- like Origen talks about life as a classroom, but he also says it's a hospital. Is there, is there medicine here of value? I don't know, man, I'm curious for you. Like, how's that been in your lived experience? Well, I just want to say first, like I, I so appreciate the way that you just shared that and the, the, the trustworthiness that comes through lived experience and integrating ideas into action, into manifesting the love through relationships and creativity and contributions to the world. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think, you know, the easiest thing for me to think about right now in relationship to integrate into lived experience is in family life. Yeah. Because it's so present to me right now. And the ways in which the suffering of my children, (laughs) the beeps of email, um, the ways in which, uh, the experiences of my family has decentered me from what I thought of myself as the central figure in my life. Wow. And then that is disorientating. How does one relate to family, uh, not as a reflection of who I want to be, but as this gracious vehicle for the love of God to flow through and in a relationship. And many parents will say this, right? When one of their kids gets hurt, they feel the pain almost more acutely than the child does. Um, and I'm in this, you know, I, this doesn't happen very often, but it's been five days since I've seen my family. They're driving back from the Midwest. Wow. And this morning I was listening to uh, a song about family and it just broke me. Yeah. And it helped explain for me why that disorientation this past week has been so present. It's like there's this love that I'm so used to experiencing through the mundane life of family relationships and not being a part of that, not being conscious that I would, I, I, how integral that is to my, my happenings in my day to day. It just flooded me. And then like tears came and I was just like, Oh, this is why I've been such a, a soggy mess this week. I just, I'm, I don't have those touchstones of that great love uh, in my physical happenstance. And yeah, so that, that's the, the canvas I feel like of my days right now is family life where I experience, you know, I wouldn't say great suffering at this moment, you know, uh, but great love as, as that doorway. Man, that is powerful. Um, wow. <laughs> I just, I love that. Um, it's so bittersweet and so beautiful and so real. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I'm going to guess something a lot of our listeners can relate to. Because at the end of the day, man, that's the whole point of the contemplative laboratory is how does, how does this actually show up in the everyday beats of our heart and breath and like relationships and realities that we, that we interact right. with? And I love how that so naturally brings us to that third question, mm-hmm. Right. How do we want to show up in the world? Because at the end of the day, getting in touch with our great love and our great suffering and, and, and letting these teachings help us do that. Um, I think it's all an avenue to this long loving look at the real, this falling in love with reality again and again and again. And you can't love something and not want to make it better or help it be the best that it can be. So when we fall in love with ourselves, with the people around us and with the world, it asks something of us. Mm -hmm. And what's great is it doesn't ask something of us in a moralistic dogmatic way. It inspires us to want to show up to make the world a better place, right? And, and that's, that's what I think, that's what I love about working for the Center for Action and Contemplation. 
um, how is this asking us to make the world a better place and ourselves a better place and our families a better place and really, really, really love, how do I want to say this? Live love into reality. Mm. And how do these teachings support, support us and sustain us in that? Jeez, that's so good. And I, I think this is going to be a really interesting to bear witness to how this question shows up in the podcast. Yeah. Because like, like all three of these questions, they're, they're very nuanced to one's own yeah. lived experience. And this one, because of, you know, where one lives in the world, one's giftings, yeah. one's own time and other commitments and responsibilities, it shows up in all those places. Yeah. But this is where I think uh, comparison is unhelpful. Yeah. Uh, and competition is unhelpful. Yeah. But to, to go back to that imagery that you shared of uh, the mystical body of Christ, yes. where we see ourselves yes. as these different aspects so yes. that when we show up, yeah. I might be showing with the pinky, but I can trust that someone else has shown up with the neck and that yeah. we can all yeah. celebrate the, 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 the diversity of the body. Yeah. Um, hopefully this connects because it, it, I led our practice this morning yeah. and I read this poem by uh, St. John of the Cross. Oof. And it landed for me because it's when you asked this question, this third question, um, it came up for me that it how it circles back to the other two questions yeah. too. And there's this sense of unknowing. So when you show up, you're not necessarily going to show up with uh, results in mind. Yeah. And or that you'll even ever see the results of, of the seeds that you've planted. And there's this brief poem by St. John the Cross that I think cuts to the heart of humility that runs through all three of these questions. I'm going to read it. Please. It's from the Ascent of Mount Carmel. They'll be thinking it was all rather special and that God had spoken and it will have been little more than nothing or nothing or less than nothing. Because if God does not give birth to humility and love and dying to self and godly simplicity and silence, what can it be? And I, for me, this strikes me with that, that level of curiosity that these questions are embedded and imprinted on our soul that, that spark this longing to not only learn more, not only to grow more, but how do I show up with the yeah. fervor of the love seated at the base of each of these questions? Yeah. And I'm excited to see how listeners will take this and, and integrate into their lives and how they show up in their own context. What, what, what is, um, how is this striking you as far as how this third question might be showing up in your life and in this podcast? Well, you know, I think, I think one of the things that I love, I love what you were saying. You were using that, the metaphor of the body of Christ, where it's like, we're all a different piece, but we're all one body, mm -hmm. right? And this idea of like, unity is not uniformity. Um, you know, for me, like, uh, I don't want to get too lost in the abstract here, but this idea that it takes all the different journeys that we're all on to do the big journey of the healing of the world, mm -hmm. right? And so we all have some different, I used to have this old old Irish Pentecostal preacher who I still love and he was a mentor. And he always used to say to me, the pain that you can feel is the pain that you can heal, right? Mm -hmm. And that's our great love and our great suffering. So again, I, I talked about like losing my mom and my brother, but what, what's more interesting, I grew up in this family, we were all pastors and we all sort of deconstructed at the same time. And we went in completely different directions, with it, right? My yeah. dad went deeper and he kind of, he went back to fundamentalism. My brother couldn't do the deconstruction and, and I lost him to depression. Uh, I, I literally lost him in the cloud. My mom deconstructed and then reconstructed in this beautiful sort of path, but then passed away before she was able to walk deeper into it. And then I'm now walking my own path and I have this great love for people who are going through mm. deconstruction and disorientation mm. because it just so deeply hits the, the, yeah, I'm actually a little bit emotional talking about it. Um, 
oh my God, what a, what a painful and beautiful and real human experience for us to pass through that. And so for me, my unique passion is helping people navigate that well, yeah. right? And helping people recognize when they're going through that, that painful wrestling, that it's not a failure of the spiritual life. It's actually, it's actually stepping deeper into it and it's finding your truest self and it's actually guiding you towards sort of your own depth and reality and, and ability to fall in love with the real reality for you and then towards your own path. That's my story, right? But I, I, I'm, I am passionate about my little part to play yeah. to help folks in their journey. And then I'm surrounded by all these amazing people here at the center and on our faculty and in our listeners and in our students. And everyone has their own unique passion and everyone has their own unique mission. So I've got friends who are doing work at the border and that's their, yeah. that's their part of healing the world, right? I have other friends who are doing really, really intense mental health work and that's their part of healing the world. Mm -hmm. I have, uh, well, I mean, jump in. Even on our staff, I see so many different people. And it's recognizing I do my tiny, tiny little contribution and you do your tiny, tiny little contribution. And as we all come together, we really, really are stepping into the love of reality that wants to heal reality and contribute to making this a more loving world. I don't know. That's a little bit of a rambling response. No. I'm having an emotional reaction, thank you. but I love it. Yeah. Thank you for that vulnerability. Um, it, it allows all of us, I think, to try to approach this conversation and this podcast with that same level of vulnerability. This is yeah. what it's all about. This is not, this is more than just a podcast. This is, yeah. this is the expression of, a life steeped in love and trying to expand that love. Yeah. Something that you had just shared reminded me of that quote from Tessa Vilecki, um, of our dear friend who she says, um, contemplatives aren't unique. Yeah. But everyone's a unique type of contemplative. And that fits in with the, the same piece of the body of Christ that we're talking yeah. about. Like every listener is going to find their own way yeah. to integrate and become their own type of contemplative and that there's such a rich history within the yeah. traditions that one can find a teacher of the past and the practices of the past. But that, that, there's also new technologies in the way that we live this contemplative life yeah. as engaged contemplatives in the world, trying to live these teachings forwards in our own home communities, yeah. in our own lives. And I think what you just shared, you offered up how you are doing that. Yeah. Um, just by sharing what you shared. So thank you for modeling how we're, gonna, we're trying to step into the work that is ours to do alone and yeah. together. Well, and I can't help but think about these amazing teachers that we get to work with. Um, I really do mean this too. I, I, if anyone's listening and it sounds like I'm doing a lot of like uh, fan service and glow up, like I, it, it, I really do. Like I think about Jim's memoir that was just published, Oof. James Finley, yeah. who's another one of our, James Finley, who's another one of our teachers, um, his memoir, The Healing Path, and where he just talks about his own experience as a survivor of abuse in, a, in an abusive childhood, in a religious institution, which was equal parts profoundly transformative and profoundly abusive. And he talks about how that wounding really was in the surface service of his wisdom, yeah. right? And his own calling to then be a teacher and a therapist. And God, you know, wherever we live on the spectrum between activist, contemplative, wherever our curiosity and our compassion takes us, what an invitation and a gift to, to sort of find our own unique path and trust that that's in the service of healing the entire world. Yeah. That's extraordinary to me. Yeah, well said. And I know you'd agree with this. Like when we bring up teachers um, and offer their gifts and their insights and wisdom, we know that they're fully human. We're not, yeah. We are not sending roses no way. all the way mm -hmm. without acknowledging the thorns. And I think what I appreciate sharing about Jim is like the trauma that he went through oh and the God. work that he had to go through yeah. to... to to bring the teaching out yeah. of those wounds is so hard 
yeah. and hard won. And I think about that for each of us in our own yeah. context. So it's recognizing the total humanity of our teachers yeah. and the the gifts that they have, the work that they have done. Yeah. And, um, the life steeped in the mystery that is continuing to heal and unfold for all of us. And so I appreciate you bringing up Jim's memoir in that light. Yeah. I think, I think Paul, what you're, what you're leading me to realize, and I'll let you get the final word, but this will be my final word, is just this beautiful invitation to recognize that every one of us every listener, every reader, every staff person, every teacher, every single good person out there doing their work to contribute to the healing of the world. We're all students. We're all teachers. Mm -hmm. We're all healing. We're all healers. We're all workers and we're all works in progress. What a glorious invitation <laughs> for us all to be in this together, right? That's it, man. I, I think you nailed it. And I and that leaves us in a place with this conversation to, to, to continue to jump off to what these future seasons are gonna look like, taking this work, knowing that we're trying to approach it with a humble curiosity and desire to grow into it and yeah. show up more fully in our own lives um, and express love in our the unique way that we have been created, uh, the unique context and relationships that we find ourselves in. And to celebrate the gift and the celebration of that gift does not turn uh, an eye away from the suffering of the world, yeah. suffering our own life, and how can we be of service in this? And that's our deep desire for this podcast is to live these teaching forwards in our lives and together as a community of listeners. Like all great conversations, this one is unfinished and will linger on. It does so because these three identified animating questions. What do we want to know? How do we want to grow? How do we want to show up in our lives and in the world? Are continually held in curiosity and lived out in our great loves, great sufferings, as well as the shrugging mundanity of our ordinary lives? These questions play well off one another as we experiment with them in day-to-day -day reality. This is life in the contemplative laboratory. If you are listening to this and exploring this in your own life, you are a part of it. And for that, we are grateful. For we hope that in this ever-expanding movement of living the teachings forward, we find ourselves supporting one another's transformation and inspiring loving action. Each season, we will move through one seminal work of Richard Rohr through the lens of these three animating questions. In the next episode of Everything Belongs, we will give a glimpse of how the format of the show will take shape in future seasons. Thanks for listening to this podcast by the Center for Action and Contemplation, an educational nonprofit that introduces seekers to the contemplative Christian path of transformation. To learn more about our work, visit us at cac.org. Everything Belongs is made possible thanks to the generosity of our supporters and the shared work of Mike Petro, Paul Swanson, Talitha Baker, Mikkel Chevrier, Izzy Spitz, Megan Hare, Sarah Palmer, Barb Lopez, Brandon Strange, and me, Corey Wayne. The music you hear is composed and provided by our friends, Hammock. And we'd also like to thank Sound On Studios for all of their work in post-production. From the high desert of New Mexico, we wish you peace and every good.